So I want to um, personally welcome Christian Harris, who's going to be our presenter today. Christian is the founder and CEO of Slip Safety Services and the host of the Safety and Risk Success podcast. I actually have um, listened to a couple of those um, podcasts before I met Christian virtually. So, um, so I think it's really good um, set of podcasts that's been out there. And actually, um, Christian Podcast was voted one of the top 10 HSC podcasts of 2021. Um, by HSC people. Um, on a personal note, I think three or four of the top 10 I have listened to. So maybe that's a good gauge. <laughs> Just a joke. Anyway, so um, Christian and his team prevent slip and fall accidents and insurance claims in busy public buildings. At last count, their work was stopping over 10 million pounds of claims each year. And this is achieved through their Chimes methodology, which Christian will be explaining today. And as part of the registration for this event, we did ask um, for attendance, um, attendees, sorry, to complete a scorecard. So hopefully some of you all had done that. That's going to help inform Christian's presentation today. And Christian's big goal is to reduce the number of slip and fall accidents globally by half a million a year. So, you know, very important topic. Um, I think this is one topic that's applicable to every industry. So really look forward to um, this discussion and I'll hand over now to Christian. Thanks, Melissa, and uh, great to see everyone. Um, it's, good to, it's good to finally meet my podcast listener. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it is going quite well, actually, to be fair. Uh, but um, no, I appreciate the, uh, the kind words. Um, so uh, I'm going to present for about half an hour, uh, get, go quite in depth uh, in certain areas, uh, but then there'll be time for Q&A. And I'm always happy to take um, questions over, over email or if you want to set up a call or whatever, then that's fine as well. Um, but I'll try and rattle through and uh, get through the content. So a bit about me. Um, as Melissa said, I'm the founder of Slip Safety Services. Um, and the host of the Safety and Risk Success podcast, where I interview uh, safety and risk leaders, <clears throat> uh, always looking for guests. So if anybody is, is interested in sharing their story and their insights, then I'd be uh, very happy to, to have you on. Uh, in terms of sort of background and credentials, uh, so the team and I uh, have helped over 5,000 client sites. Um, I've been involved in some very high profile uh, slip and fall cases, such as this co-op case uh, which which resulted in a death in 2015 uh, and yeah we're, we're 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 saving about 10 million of claims a year um over the last three years and i put a, a photo of ronaldo up because about a third of ronaldo is is 10 million based on his last transfer fee um it's certainly more expensive than uh, than than messi going to psg for any football fans um we work with a number of insurers, brokers, law firms, and then some big uh, corporate clients like CBRE. Uh, I've done a number of IOSH events, uh, done some stuff for IRSM as well, uh, and, and architects and various other people. So do a fair bit of this kind of, uh, this kind of talking. Uh, so if you'll, uh, uh, divulge, if you'll give me a minute or two, I'll just give you a bit of backstory on me and why um, I'm sort of really interested and passionate about this, uh, this subject of safety. So if you cast your mind back to the summer of 2012, just before the Olympics, uh, and I lived, uh, well, I live, I still live in London, but at that time I lived uh, quite close actually to the Olympic Stadium in kind of East London. Um, and this was a time before kids. So a Sunday, uh, Sunday the 13th of May, uh, was um, a lion uh, and then nipping around the corner to the deli to grab a croissant or something for, for breakfast and grab the Sunday Times and, and relax a bit with, uh, with my girlfriend at the time and now wife. Uh, but we decided on this particular day to take a trip to um, a place called Columbia Road Flower Market, which is, uh, funny enough, when you look at that photo now, you think, wow, that's a lot of people. Uh, but at the time, that was, that was just normal life, I suppose. Uh, but it's a quite a famous flower market in East London. And we went and bought some flowers and had some lunch and had a nice time. Uh, on the way back, uh, we wanted to nip into Sainsbury's uh, in Islington to grab some groceries. Uh, so we drove, uh, drove there, parked in the car, uh, locked the car door, rounded the corner onto this street. Because uh, you had to walk down this street on the right hand side here to, to get around to the, the store entrance at the front. 
Um, and then that's the last thing that I remember for several hours because uh, a car came around that corner too fast, mounted the curb uh, and plowed into me and, and ran me over. So um, that was me uh, later that day, not looking my best, although I've got um, much, many fewer gray hairs uh, there than I do now, but uh, that's, I suppose that's to be expected. Um, but I suffered a uh, broken collarbone and some, some neck damage and broken wrist and, and various other, you know, cuts and, 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 and scrapes and bruises and things. Um, but uh, what that really uh, brought home to me and, and you know, uh, I always say I was unlucky that it happened, but lucky it wasn't as, you know, it could have been worse, obviously, than it was. Um, just really that, you know, these accidents that aren't your fault can happen to anybody. Uh, at any time and they can have a really profound effect on your life and um, if you look through the statistics at the biggest cause of, of accidents injuries uh, insurance claims etc throughout the world across sectors um, it slips trips and falls so uh, that's kind of what uh, pushes me on in this particular area to try and make an impact so uh, when it comes to, to slips and trips, then um, what do most people do to try and address this? Well, this is pretty common, isn't it? You know, um, everybody plonks their yellow floor sign out at the earliest sign of any rain. And they think that they're discharging their duty of care uh, and doing the best job that they can. Uh, I took this photograph in a convenience store. Um, I think it was in Paddington train station in London. But, you know, this is a pretty common uh common occurrence right wet floor stick a sign out we're fine nothing's going to happen we, we're not going to get into trouble um but actually uh, this this exact scenario uh, as in you know water on a floor in a supermarket and a wet floor sign was there on the floor um was what led to the co-op death that i mentioned and that i was involved in um gentleman uh slipped over banged the back of his head uh, and died and uh, that led obviously to a uh, civil uh, claim, but also a criminal uh, court proceeding. And uh, ultimately co-op had a 400,000 pound criminal fine. And um, looking at the kind of summing up of, of that case by Cornwall Council, uh, Sarah Jane Brown, who actually uh, I'm hoping will be on the podcast soon. She's kind of said she's interested in principle to do it. Uh, she said this, uh, that the case demonstrates the importance of slip risks being adequately controlled. It should serve as a warning to the retail industry and particularly supermarkets that signage alone is not an adequate control. Proactive measures must be taken to either prevent floors becoming slippery or precluding public access. And obviously these, this is the key bit here. Signage alone is not an adequate control, but actually most companies, um, signage is their, pretty much their only control measure in many cases. Um, You've got to be proactive. Um, you've either got to stop floors being walked upon if they're wet and they're slippery or have floors that are safe to walk upon when they're wet is what she's saying here. The good thing is that you can make a big impact uh, on these accidents. So although they're traditionally, you know, a third of, of, of accidents, a third of claims, a uh, billion pounds a year of, of claims in the UK um, annually, uh, you can reduce these accidents and these claims and these injuries significantly. So that's the good news. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, Melissa mentioned uh, that we've kind of deconstructed why slips happen uh, and put it into an acronym called CHIMES. So I'm gonna run through that uh, with you and what that means. And then uh, based on the results of the uh, scorecard that some of you took, we're gonna do a bit of a deep dive into a couple of, of these. Uh, so CHIMES stands for Contamination, heal, individual, maintenance, environment, and surface. So these are the six areas that you need to look at if you want to try and control your, uh, your slip risks in your buildings. And when I show this to people, uh, typically I get two reactions. The first is that all makes sense. Uh, and I hadn't realized there was as much detail to this subject uh, as I now realize. Uh, and the second is, oh, we're only dealing with perhaps one or two of those, and we're certainly not dealing with all six. Um, so I think one big uh, message is, you know, that, that this is a, uh, it needs a holistic solution. Um, it's not a, a straightforward a problem as people perceive it to be. Um, and so you need to be looking at all of these uh, different factors. 
Uh, just to quickly explain each of them, uh, contamination basically is, you know, what, what is on the floor, what contaminants are on the floor that might cause somebody to slip. So if a floor is clean and dry, it's going to be safe, but any sort of contamination from water to grease to dust uh, to, to food, uh, semi-solids can, can make it slippery. Heel is all about footwear. So uh, what footwear are people wearing? Uh, because clearly for a slip to happen, a heel has to touch a floor. Individual is people factors. Uh, so we can all walk on slippery when wet floors, uh, but if we're pushing, pulling, twisting, turning, if we're distracted, uh, then the likelihood is we're, 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 more, uh, we're more likely to have an accident uh, or we're more likely to suffer a slip and actually fall because we, we haven't got the time to self-address. Maintenance is all about how floor surfaces are looked after over time. So that includes cleaning, which is important, uh, wear and tear and changes to surfaces, uh, but also things like change of use. Environment is obviously things like the weather, but also steps, stairs, slopes, um, lighting. And then surface is the floor. So, you know, how uh, slippery or, or not is the floor. Uh, and the question, I suppose, for all of these is, you know, to what extent can we control them? So which are controllable and when? Uh, so something like heel, uh, is it, if you can get safety footwear right, and there's a lot of uh, not very effective safety footwear when it comes to slip resistance uh, on the marketplace, but if you can get that right, uh, it can have a massive um, beneficial effect on the risk to your members of staff. But obviously, if you're operating a restaurant, you can't control what members of public are wearing on their feet. So therefore, heel could be a good control measure back of house, but it's not really that relevant front of house. So we've um, devised this digital uh, slip safety scorecard and it's, it's basically a, a test, it takes five minutes to complete and it gives you a, a self-diagnostic tool. So it asks you about 40 questions and then it gives you a score on each of those six areas. So you get a score for, for, for contamination, a score for heal, et cetera. So you can start to see where you're uh, doing better and where you've got more room for improvement. And then it gives you an overall score as well. So thanks to those that, uh, that took this uh, before uh, before this session. Um, if uh, having seen the session, you're interested in, in doing it, then you can find it on the website. Uh, I think there's a link in the uh, meeting invite for this as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite a good way of just getting a snapshot view of where you stand on all of these six factors. So we're going to use the results from, uh, from, the, uh, from those of you that took the scorecard in advance to do it a bit of a deep dive. So of those that took the scorecard, these were the scores <clears throat> that we had as a percentage. So contamination, 23%, heal, 47%, not bad. Individual, 61%, pretty good. So that suggests, you know, we've got good safety culture doing pretty well at that, for example. Uh, maintenance, 52%, environment, 41 surface, 32 So based on those scores, um, the two areas that were sort of the, weak, the weakest or had the most room for improvement were contamination surface so we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into those um, but if anybody wants to go in in more detail on any of the others then you know feel free to reach out to me or ask questions at the end as well so uh, let's go into contamination then so I mentioned this before but a clean dry floor is not slippery but the question is what happens when you put some contamination on the floor and then someone's foot hits it uh, and that's that's a different scenario so the first thing to think about is what contamination are you trying to deal with? So it could be water, it could be oil, it could be um, things like dust, it could be semi-solids, it could even be the, the good old banana skin. But trying to identify the contamination you've got is really important because uh, if you can't eliminate contamination, if you think about the hierarchy of controls, then it's how do we manage that? And managing contamination is by trying to remove it from the floor uh, and that, that involves cleaning. But if you try to clean um, calcium, let's say, uh, in the same way as, uh, as oil, then it's not going to work. So you need to be understanding what, contaminate, what contamination uh, you've got to deal with. So that's the first thing I would say as a, as a top tip. You need to think about the difference between um, accidental contamination and sort of more intentional 
um, contamination, or another way of thinking this about this would be um, occasional contamination or regular contamination. Because if you consider, let's say, a kitchen or a building entrance or a washroom, that floor uh, or those floors in, in those areas are going to regularly become wet and contaminated. Whereas if you think about, uh, you know, an office building on the 12th floor in a corridor between meeting rooms, it's very unlikely that that floor uh, is going to get contaminated. And so you're going to need to deal with things differently and more intensively in areas where the contamination is more frequent or even constant than in areas where it's, uh, it's less likely. So that's something to consider. And then there's a couple of different axes to think about here. Um, there, there's things, there's contamination that's avoidable versus unavoidable. And then there's the contamination which is visible versus invisible. So thinking about um, COVID, which obviously we're, we're all sick of talking about, but uh, COVID is, is clearly an invisible uh, enemy, for want of a better term, that's the expression that's been used, but um, you can't see if a surface has COVID on it. Um, there are ways to test for that, but you can't see it. So it's whereas you could see potentially um, a puddle on a floor. Um, but if we think about a puddle on a floor, you know, if you've got a white floor and somebody spills some Coca-Cola or orange juice, then that's going to be visible. Whereas uh, if you then mop up that spillage uh, with some water and leave a thin film of, of translucent water on the, on the surface, that's not going to be visible. So going into the detail of how you manage contamination um, around, you know, what can be seen and what can't be seen uh, is really important. And then thinking about, you know, as I said, a, a bit around uh, before around intentional versus accidental, you know, what can we avoid? What can't we avoid? And you can almost start putting together a bit of a matrix of different areas and different zones within your building where you know what contamination you've got, you know how likely it is, and then you can put it in, in place a plan to, uh, to deal with that. Um, so how do you know if you've got a problem with contamination? So uh, this is quite typical. Um, the, you know, a floor here that looks clean, because again, um, you can't necessarily see the contamination, but you can see that middle tile is actually much cleaner than the rest. But you wouldn't expect that there was a problem because the floor looks pretty clean. And here, uh, an example in a shopping centre where you've got a shiny floor, and most people think, well, if it's shiny, it's clean. But you can clearly see there that actually the shine in this case is actually sort of buffed in uh, contamination. So, you know, is it shiny or is it clean? Uh, question mark. So it's thinking about, again, going into a bit more depth than you might otherwise have imagined. And I guess challenging in a nice way, uh, facilities managers, cleaning contractors or cleaning staff, just to say, you know, are we sure that it's clean? It might look OK, but, but is it is it really clean and therefore safe? Uh, so what you can do is you can get some proof and some scientific testing around this. So how much contamination is on the surface? Uh, you can do uh, swab testing, you can do ATP uh, swabbing to, to, to measure how clean the surface is. There's also a product called Fresh Check, which is a spray, uh, and that works in the same way of measuring ATP, uh, but you just spray it on, you don't need the, um, the expensive equipment. Um, ATP, you're probably familiar with if you work in food safety. Um, Fresh Check, uh, you just spray it on, if it changes colour, then it, it tells you to what extent the surface is contaminated. So. What we want to be moving towards is some evidence-based, uh, an evidence-based approach where we're not just taking it as read that if something looks pretty clean and we can't see any contamination, that there isn't contamination there. Uh, moving on to surface then, um, the floor uh, is always relevant to a, a slip, of course, because, um, you know, you need something to slip on. Uh, so the heel is always relevant uh, and the floor is always relevant, but again, the heel is not always controllable. Um, just like contamination, you can measure how safe uh, floor surfaces are, and therefore if you can control your floor, uh, you can control the risk. Um, it's all about giving yourself a chance. So if you've got a, a decent surface, so uh, you know, a surface with a, a, the right kind of slip resistance for the environment that it's in. Even if you've got 
uh, not such good performance on the other chimes, then the floor may well still be safe when wet and therefore accidents could well be unlikely. Conversely, if you imagined you were operating a leisure centre with a swimming pool, uh, if you put a sheet of glass on the poolside floor, um, you know, that's going to be slippery when it's wet. It doesn't really matter what else you do uh, in terms of managing the other chimes, because fundamentally that floor is going to get wet because it's around a poolside. And if it's a slippery floor, it doesn't matter how much you clean it, it doesn't matter what footwear you, you have, it doesn't matter how many signs you put up, etc. Um, you're going to find that you're going to have problems because the floor is never going to be safe when wet. So uh, getting the surface right is... Uh, is a key thing to uh, to try to reduce the likelihood of these accidents. So the question then is, well, what is a slip resistant floor? Now, um, if we were all in a room together, I do I do a pop quiz and I would um, ask you to tell me which is the most uh, by show of hands, the most slip resistant and the least slip resistant. But perhaps what we could do today is in the chat, if you said it's A, B, C, uh, D, E, left from left to right. Firstly, which do you think is the most slip resistant floor? A, B, C, D or E? Stick it in the chat. D's, A's, D's, D's, lots of D's. Yeah, lots of D's, some A's as well. A's and D's seem to be the most popular. Okay, great. So what about the, the least slip resistant floor, A, B, C, D, or E. Put that in the chat. E, 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 lots of E's. Oh, Roger Holt loves E. He's got E's even written E. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. So it, so there's there's pretty much, oh, B, oh, interesting. Nina, you always slip on those. Okay, well, I'll touch on that in a sec. Um, now, most people think I'm a nice guy, uh, but I haven't been very nice to you here, guys, because I've tricked you, uh, because I've asked you what's a slip resistant floor, but I haven't given you a key piece of information, which is that um, whether a floor is dry or wet is going to have a big effect on how slippery or not it is. So actually, every single one of these floors, I can tell you uh, without hesitation, will have good slip resistance when they're dry and not contaminated. But as for when they're wet or contaminated, it's impossible to say uh, because as Nina alluded to, checker plates, you know, floor B, uh, you see that everywhere in high risk areas that are gonna get wet because people look at it and think, oh, it's textured, it's bound to be slip resistant. But actually, uh, normally it's quite slippery when wet. Um, the, clearly the floor on the right-hand side, highly polished, um, natural stone is, is going to be slippery when it's wet but the rest of them you know you can't really tell just by looking at them um and that's that's a challenge so we, we've got to get over this we've got to get over the misperception that you can tell just by looking at a floor how slippery it is or it isn't the good thing is uh there is a way of testing this so i'm going to show you a video uh this is a contraption called a pendulum test, which is what the HSE use to measure how uh, slip resistant floors are. Uh, it's also so so in any criminal prosecutions, you're likely to have uh, somebody from the HSL uh, in Buxton coming in and doing this testing. Uh, it's also used uh, increasingly in court cases as well. Uh, so it's, it's a very useful bit of information uh, for you to have. So what I'll do is I'll show you the video first of it being used, and then I'll tell you uh, what it's doing, and then I'll show you, uh, show you the video again. So spraying the floor with water, releasing the foot, swinging through. So what this is doing, um, it's called a pendulum because it swings, uh, but it's mimicking what happens when your heel strikes a floor. So if you imagine walking along, uh, your, your, when you contact the floor it's the back of your heel striking the floor at sort of a 35-ish degree angle with all of your weight on it and the extent to which there's friction between the foot and the floor 
uh, will determine whether you're going to slip or not. So what this machine is doing is mimicking that interaction between the heel and the floor, uh, but it's standardizing the heel. So therefore all it's measuring uh, is the floor. As it swings through, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a gauge and there's a pointer pointing to the gauge. And that is the number, the coefficient of friction uh, that the, 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 the test is giving you. And when we test the floor in dry conditions and wet conditions, so typically you're going to get a much higher uh, slip resistance in dry conditions than in wet conditions. So we'll just um, watch it again. Now you've had the explanation. So he's going to spray the floor, release the foot. You'll see the heel striking the floor to mimic the, the heel strike of a real person swinging through, pushing the pointer to the left-hand side. And that pointer gives you a number. And I'll tell you what that number means in a minute. So that's a pendulum test. Um, so the number is called a pendulum test value. And there are three categories of slip potential. So if you have a score of between zero and 24, you have a high slip potential. If you have a score of between 25 and 35, you have a moderate slip potential. And a score of 36 or above is a low slip potential. And we can take that a step further because you can also correlate a risk uh, exposure to the PTV. So over on the right hand side, the green, uh, the low slip potential of a score of 36, there's a one in a million risk exposure. Whereas over towards the left, if you've got a PTV of 24, uh, then it's a one in 20 risk exposure. Now, that doesn't mean that one in 20 people will slip and fall, but it means that one in 20 people are at risk of a slip and fall. So in other words, if you've got a floor uh, that's achieving uh, a pendulum test value of 24 in an environment that is uh, constantly or foreseeably uh, wet or contaminated. Not, you're not in you've not done that. No one's done that. Oh, I believe someone. you're the champ. Oh, to someone say, needs to mute, please. Down, and I'm sorry, it's my fault. Sorry about that, Christian. That's okay. Always um, happens. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you've got if you've got that 24 PTV you're, uh, and it's an environment that's constantly getting wet or contaminated, you're relying on one in 20 people doing something to self-address to avoid an accident happening. Whereas if you're in the green zone, uh, then you're only relying on one in a million people. So what we tend to find when we're doing this testing is that um, there's not much in the orange. It tends to either be that floors are very good, they're looked after well and they're safe. When, even when wet or they're down in that red zone. So what we're trying to then do is actually move people as far as we can along to the right to reduce that risk. Um, so why do that testing? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, because taking this example here, which is, a, which is a photograph that I took of the floor that we were doing, um, you can dramatically reduce the risk, but obviously you don't know that until you've got the testing. So you're, quantif you're quantifying the risk uh, and therefore uh, as with any number, if you've got a number that you're measuring, you can manage it. And then the other reason is that I mentioned we work with a number of law firms. Uh, David Scott from Keos, for, who I've interviewed on the podcast, for example, you know, he's pretty firm about this. If you've got uh, compliant slip test data, you should be able to defend any claims that come in. So if, you, if you're doing this testing proactively uh, and in advance of, of an issue, if you've got that test certificate to say, you know, the floors in our washrooms were safe when wet. Uh, even if an accident happens, you'll be able to demonstrate you've discharged your duty of care. Because remember, your obligation isn't to prevent every accident, it's to do what's reasonable. Um, so to sum up then, I think I'm doing okay on time. Um, think about chimes, think about looking at this holistically. Um, but what I would say is uh, perhaps a slightly advanced move, but it's really important to, to understand this. Um, we're not playing the addition game when we're thinking about chimes. So we're not scoring ourselves as a percentage or whatever, or a number out of 10 and adding all those scores together. That's not the way we want to do it. We want to play the multiplication game. Um, and the point here is that if we're scoring two out of 10 across the board, we're getting a score of 64. 
Whereas actually, if we're scoring seven out of ten, which isn't is far from perfect, we're getting a score of one hundred seventeen thousand, not nearly one hundred eighteen thousand, and that's because these all of these factors have in um, relationships with one another. You know, surface contamination, maintenance, for example, are all aligned uh, very closely, but you know, individual environment, heel environment, they all interrelate. So, the better we can do across the board by playing this multiplication game. And the better we're going to do at reducing the likelihood of, uh, of slips and falls happening. So uh, to summarise then in terms of um, you know, what it is that we're talking about here and, and why I'm really interested in this, um, I think it's fair to say that I'm really known for caring quite passionately, as I'm sure you guys do because of what you do, uh, about a subject that often people don't um, want to invest that much time into or, or don't want to worry about too much, which is that really what, what we try to do is, is to make people feel safer. So it's all about making, you know, for you guys, for example, having this presentation, hopefully you go away and you now feel a bit safer because you've got more understanding and more comprehension and more education around slips and falls. And in turn, you can take some steps to reduce that risk and make your colleagues and your customers feel safer. And that's really what it's all about for me. Um, call to action. Uh, if uh, that's resonated uh, in any way, um, please do take the scorecard if you haven't, but, but do connect on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn uh, and do, do join Melissa and you can be listener number two uh, of the podcast, which is on all of the, uh, all of the different podcasting um, platforms. So that's it for me in terms of the content. Thank you very much. Um, pretty much on time, I think. Um, 30 seconds to spare. Perfect. Um, very happy to take questions. My contact details are there, um, but do, as I say, connect and uh, have a listen to the podcast as well. Great. No, thank you, um, Christian. That was really good. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who listened, <laughs> but it's really, it's a good podcast, I have to say. Um, I know there's being, a lot of... I'm being self-deprecating. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of podcasts out there, but but it's one of the good ones as well. Um, we've got a, um, a few questions coming in um, since um, in the last five minutes, which is good. So um, I, I think it's that pendulum test. So maybe I'll be facetious and ask a question because um, I personally didn't know about it until I saw um, the Mercy side um, video, which sure. for people I've posted a link of because um, Christian provides um, full details of all six elements. We because of the time we focus on two. So you said something about the HSC um, uses it. It seems like after an event has happened. So is there a proactive kind of requirement for this test to be done? Uh, so there's no there's no legal requirements about pendulum testing. Um, the the Health and Safety at Work Act and Occupiers Liability Act and all this other stuff uh, obviously are talking about risk assessment based approach and to be safe and and you know avoid risk and all those other things. But the reality is that uh, when it comes down to a, either a HSC uh, inspector um, or a uh, civil claim then they're gonna be asking for that uh, testing. And, and typically um, it comes down to a very black and white, you know, was it in the green zone or not, uh, as to whether uh, wh whether you're gonna be able to defend uh, a claim. Mm -hmm. um, what we see and what we recommend is that people should try to be more proactive about it because, uh, you know, the insurers that we work with, for example, um, would would and the lawyers would like to see evidence of this being done proactively because then they see that you're taking it seriously, um, you're a, a good risk as it were, uh, and actually the insurance companies will often fund that kind of testing work as well. Uh, so it's not expensive, you know, it's it's five hundred quid to go and do a, the testing, um, but obviously if you've got ten sites, that starts to add up. But um, typically insurers will. Um, sometimes fully fund but but often uh, part fund so perhaps go 50 50 on the cost of doing that kind of testing so you know for that if it's going to cost you 250 quid it's it's it's, it's pretty uh, pretty good value for money no good thanks and maybe that um touches what nina has asked um Chuck's, is the pendulum test equipment available to buy commercially yep. um i perform hns audits at my site and will find this very useful 
Yep. So you can buy it. Um, the, the kit and the box and the calibration and all that stuff is is about five grand. Um, there are other tests available too. Uh, so whilst that's the gold standard test and, and it's the kind of legally reputable uh, test that's going to be used in court, there are other tests that are easier to use. So you might be familiar with, uh, they call them Kennys sometimes, like little little boxes that they put on floors, which measure the, measure the surface roughness. Uh, that's much cheaper to buy. That's a few hundred pounds and will give you a good indicative um, level of slip resistance. There's another test called a slip alert, which is like a little um, car going down a ramp and sliding along the floor. And that's uh, cheap. That's also cheaper. That's a couple of grand. Um, so what we, what we tend to suggest um, is that uh, you get your benchmarking with the pendulum, whether you do that yourself or, or, or get a specialist in like us to help you. And then potentially if you want to go and do ongoing monitoring, um, you might be better off with one of those other tests, uh, as long as you're aware of the what the numbers mean and the limitations and all that stuff. But, uh, but it's they're, they're much easier to use, quicker to use, cheaper to use than, than doing pendulum testing. But yeah, you can buy them. Okay, no thanks. Um, Andrew Ripplington, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? I'm assuming Andrew's still on. Mm, no? Okay. Andrew asks, um, how much do you think designers in the construction sector know about this when specifying design floor materials? Uh, more than, so I've been doing this for about 10 years um, and they know much more now than they did then. Um, but I think there's still a way to go. So we still, you know, very often get calls right at the end of projects saying things like, uh, we're about to hand over this five-star hotel and we've just realized they've specified shiny marble in the bathroom floors and somebody's just figured out that the bathroom floor is going to get wet. Uh, so there's still a way to go. But I mean, I, I as well as kind of IOSH uh, events like this, I, I, I try and do uh, events like this for um, construction industry and architects and stuff as well. So it is it is better than it was. Um, and the industry, the floor supply industry is, is better at giving the data. Uh, but I still think there's a bit of a way to go. Mm, okay. And then going back to the test, um, Ray Jeffrey mentioned that he was on holiday. This might have been a while ago. <laughs> um, and so an insurance company using a pendulum after someone had slipped on steps and broke their back. Yeah. So it seems reactive versus proactive. Yeah. So yeah, typically in a court case, um, if it's some, if it's a serious accident like that, um, so I do a lot of this kind of work um, as an expert witness. So you, you, the insurer and the claimants list are likely to engage people to come in and do the slip testing. Um, but yeah, it's it, for me. It's about trying to stop the accident from happening in the first place, obviously. And if we can get in there and and and, and do do the scorecard. Uh, which is which is free and takes five minutes and gives you a good idea and, 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 a, and a, a roadmap to improve. And then if you think it's ne if you think it's appropriate, get some proactive slip testing done as part of that. Well, then you're in a much much better place to try and stop these things from happening rather than waiting for them to happen and, and, and then having to deal with the consequences. Yeah. So Alan asked, um, could it be argued this is covered by CDM? Um, it could, but again, in, in reality, um, if there's an accident and a claim, it's gonna somebody's gonna get asked to call to, to get a, a slip test and the slip whatever the slip test says is, is what's gonna go rather than necessarily what the uh, what was said, you know, when the when the building was built. Anything else, Alan, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so I, I keep I was off mute. thinking more more for leverage, you know, in terms of design and selection. <clears throat> At the initial stage, because CDM is meant to be from, you know, construction through to demolition. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay. It's catch twenty two, really. I suppose. Well, the thing is, um, you know, so for example, uh, on Monday, I I live in London, in southeast London, and I, we got a call from a, a company that we've done a few bits of work for before, saying um, we're doing some work in Brixton Market on resurfacing their floors. Could you come and do a slip test? Uh, and this is a big, it's a big old area. So it's a big project they've been doing for a few weeks. And when we slip tested, uh, so this was my 4am call on, on Monday morning. Uh, when we, when I slip tested the floors that um, they'd literally just done, you know, as in the night before, and they were very, very slip resistant when wet. When we slip tested the floors that were, had been, had been in situ for a few more weeks, the slip resistance was much lower. 
um, as we found it. And then when we cleaned the floor, effectively it shot back up again to what it was. So um, what gets missed often is people think about this, the floor, but again, they don't look at that holistic piece. So they don't think about the contamination and the, and the maintenance of the, of, of the floor. So you can, have a, you can have a good floor, but if you don't clean it that well and maintain it particularly well, uh, it, it, it's likely to, to become slippery over time. Um, so again, that's where having some kind of maintenance and monitoring uh, program is, is quite useful. Mm. Okay. And I, I think considering on the, the theme, David Clifton asked if it was designer's rag list, of which I then asked him what rag was. And he said red, amber, green risk that remain after design stage. So uh, yeah. maybe connected with that. Okay. Um, can you go back, Christian, you know, to the, um, the graph that showed the results of the people from um, who, who completed the scorecard? Just had a question while others may think of other questions. Yeah. I know you focused on the two lowest scores for those who had answered, but based on the work you've done, are those the two generally across most businesses? I, I know it may be really dependent on the industry. Or is there one um, in particular that's the top? No, it does. It, it really does vary. So it does. It does depend on industry quite often. Um, to, to 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 be fair, and and because if you think about um, heel, for example, if you're in manufacturing, then footwear is is going to be something that you're really on top of and, and really aware of. Whereas if you're a retailer, there's less you can do uh, mm -hmm. around around footwear. Um, but I think I mean it's fair to say that surface is typically uh people are aware of it but they have they typically aren't ha haven't got the right data to back up things so they're typically looking at things from the perspective of does it look okay does it look like an anti-slip floor uh, rather than you know we've got a piece of paper that proves it's uh, it's safe when wet okay okay no thanks um i was asking ray i think ray said something about can i mention nhs designers i wasn't sure um, Ray, was, did you have a question? I don't know if Ray is still on. I can't see everyone, so, okay. Anyone else has any questions for Christian? I saw there's a comment from Elizabeth saying, um, realize I may have an issue with overshoes and how we manage the use of them on our floors. I mean, overshoes, um, yeah, if you think about it, if you've got uh, a very slip resistant shoe um, and you might have a, a decent um, floor as well but if you put a blue one of those typical blue flimsy overshoes between the foot and the floor you're creating a loss of, of friction so overshoes um, sometimes do uh, provide some some issues to be honest okay no thanks great oh wait something else has come out let me just go back and check. Um, oh, everyone just, you know, saying great um, presentation, um, informative, etc. So I know a few people have asked. Um, I, I believe, Christian, the presentation will be made available for us to share. Yep. And the recording will be posted on um, our LinkedIn page. Um, it will be available via YouTube as well. Um, so just want to say thanks, Christian, for this. Um, I know it was bite-sized, but... Um, there is a, a more detailed presentation. Um, I've posted that on the um, the chat um, where you go into the other four um, areas as well. Yeah. Excellent. I just want to remind people that we do have um, continuing for another half an hour where we'll go into some IOSH um, branch updates. Um, I couldn't find, oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody was commenting. Okay, great. Not seeing any other questions. Last call for questions. If not, good. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, look forward to continuing to listen to you on your podcast and um, following you on LinkedIn. It's really good. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks. You can see on to um, if you want to hear more about Children Branch. <laughs> I've, I've got I've got two uh, two kids downstairs. I need to go and uh, entertain. So uh, I'll, I'll wish you wish you uh, well and thank you very much for inviting me. No, thank you so much. Really informative. Really appreciate it. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thanks, thank you, Christian. Thank you. Cheers. All righty, good. So